Well, some people say that uh, observatories in Ohio and skygazing goes back a couple millennia. And the more our archaeologists and uh, some of our astronomers look at some of the earthworks in Ohio, people have been uh, building observing centers for a long time, this being up in Newark, Ohio. And in recent decades, we've found that it's built so that people could observe some of the motions of the sky. Up until the 1960s even, uh, we kept building things. And this was up at Ohio State. This was the uh, Big Ear. It was the first and only uh, operation on the planet Earth searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's no longer there, but it was a, a leader like some of the rest of this stuff in Ohio. I, up in Hudson, Ohio, at uh, Western Reserve College, I don't know if you can see it over there on the corner, there's a, a little observatory called Loomis Observatory, third observatory built in North America, and it was in 1836, and it's still there today. It doesn't get used a whole lot, but the original telescope is still there. It's a four-inch Troughton and Sims that was built in, in London. A few years later, this fella was one of the uh, leaders in promoting observation and uh, researching our universe. This is Ormsby McKnight Mitchell out of Cincinnati, and he was promoting the establishment of an uh, uh, astronomical observatory there, and he solicited the assistance of John Quincy Adams, former president of the United States and a member of the U.S. Congress who traveled to Ohio by canal boat and stagecoach to lay the cornerstone of that observatory in 1843 and, the t and gave a, a half of a three-hour lecture on the history of astronomy. This guy, he, he, tr he was instrumental in getting four major observatories established in the United States, Cincinnati Observatory, the U.S. Naval Observatory, the Smithsonian Astrophysical uh, Facility, and the Harvard Observatory. This is the telescope, that, and it's, con it's considered the oldest and longest continuously operating telescope in North America. It's a Mertz and Mahler, 12-inch, made in, in Europe. And uh, you can look at the moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn in it on a clear night anytime. Uh, Alvin Clark and his sons. Alvin Clark was out of uh, Massachusetts, but he, ended, he was a, a painter and engraver, and he started grinding glasses for lenses in the 1840s. And he ended up putting his fingers on some of the biggest telescopes in the world repeatedly um, until he built uh, the, the lens for the Yerkes Observatory in uh, the 1890s, a 40-inch lens. No, none has ever been made larger. It's not possible with technology to do that. Uh, this is the Cincinnati Observatory. This, the picture I showed you got demolished in uh, 1871 because Procter & Gamble and Porkopolis put up too much soot. They couldn't see the sky anymore. And, they moved um, outside of town a little bit and built this facility in 1871. And then in uh, 1904, they got another telescope. So they built a second observatory. In the big, tel in the big observatory, they put a, an Alvin Clark. Uh, oh, there's the John Quincy Adams uh, cornerstone there. Still there. They, they relocated it to the new observatory. Thought you wanted to see that. Anyway, then they put in the uh, Alvin Clark 16-inch refractor telescope there. And they put that in the big building and took the old Mertz and Mahler and they built another observatory for it next to it. And that's there today. It has a, a dome and a cone. The dome is for the uh, Mertz and Mahler and the cone is for a transit uh, telescope to watch things cross the meridian. Then there's a fellow named John Bashir. He's out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He ended up putting his fingers on a lot of telescopes all around the world, uh, especially with lenses, but he was also involved in the mechanics. Roughly around the same time, there were two guys up in Cleveland, Warner and Swayze. They were into making turret lathes, but they ended up making the instruments for the telescopes. They, they were never into, uh, right off the bat, making lenses or mirrors, but they made the, the mechanical infrastructure for most of the biggest telescopes in the world, uh, including the instrument for the Yerkes Observatory. So Alvin Clark made the uh, lens, and Warner and Swayze company made the rest of that operation there. At the same time, over in Greenville, Ohio, there were four brothers, the Lohman brothers, who were making telescopes. They started out 
uh, making cameras and, and carriages, and they were inventors, the four of them, and they got into telescopes, and they made some fairly significant telescopes uh, that got around the, the country, looking very much similar to, to uh, the rest of the people who are in the business there. You can see the Lohman brothers. They were bought out by Warner and Swayze about the time of the Depression. One of their telescopes was down at Miami University, and there was a fellow up in Delphus, Ohio, Northwest Ohio, who was a big time stargazer, comet hunter. He had discovered 16 comets. And so the University of uh, Miami gave him their observatory and telescope. So there's the Lohman uh, telescope sticking out of the Miami University after it's been located up to Northwest Ohio. Then there's a fellow from 20 miles from here or less, uh, George Willis Ritchie. He, w he started out doing astrophotography, but he ended up being involved in making the mirrors for some of the biggest telescopes in the world time and again, the 60-inch and the 100-inch mirrors uh, for the big telescopes out at Mount Wilson in California. He was working with a guy named George Ellery Hale, and, and they had a dispute, so he got fired. But he ended up hooking up with a Frenchman named uh, Chrétien, and they uh, dissolved, designed a new type of telescope, and it's been used on most of the major telescopes around the world, including the Hubble, Tace, Hubble Space Telescope since then from Tupper's Plains, Ohio. That'd be Meigs County. Warner and Swayze, a uh, little later on, built this observatory in 1919 in Cleveland, donated it to Case School of Applied Science. And a few years later, they added another observatory to it and put two, two telescopes in there, a nine inch refractor and uh, this other uh, 24 inch Burrell Schmidt. They eventually moved these things out to Kitt Peak in Arizona and unfortunately the Observatory has seen better days. Sad story. Mr. Swayze was also on the board of Denison College in uh, Granville, Ohio. He donated a, an observatory with a telescope to them. There's the observatory next to the Swayze Chapel. I guess he made a lot of money making turret lasers. The uh, telescope business cost them money. Was not a money maker for him. Anyway, this is the inside of the Swayze uh, Observatory with their refractor, their Warner and Swayze refractor. This is the Hiram Observatory up in Northeast Ohio, and it has a Warner and Swayze uh, telescope with a Henry Bra or a John Brashier lens in the end of it. So these guys ended up all working together. You know, Warner and Swayze bought out the Lorman brothers, and and Sh Brashier and the Warner and Swayze worked together. Clark and Warner and Swayze worked together. This is uh, the observatory at Ohio State University called the Macmillan Observatory. It had a 12-inch refractor on it. The uh, Ohio State University decided to demolish that uh, facility in 1976, but the telescope is still in business up at Heidelberg College up in Northwest Ohio. Then there's J.W. Fecker, the fellow who is responsible for the telescope that we're rededicating today. He, uh, his dad was, he's, his dad was from Germany, and he ran a telescope-making business in Germany, grinding lenses and stuff like that, and he eventually ended up with Warner and Swayze in Cleveland. Warner and Swayze considered him their number one technician and guy on the job. And then J.W. Fecker, that'd be James Walter, he uh, was raised and put to school, went to uh, Case School of Applied Science there, and then uh, went on to Warner and Swayze. So he was connected to Warner and Swayze. And, uh, when John Brashear died, they encouraged him to buy the Brashear works out of Pittsburgh. He held off until the second guy in charge died, and then he took over the uh, Brashear telescope works in Pittsburgh. And one of the first things he did was build the uh, telescope for the Perkins Observatory, just north of uh, Columbus. It was owned by Ohio Wesleyan, and it has a 69-inch um, reflector telescope in that. And it was one of his early projects, right off the bat, making the big stuff. Then there's the Clark Observatory up at uh, Mount Union College in, um, in Alliance, Ohio, and it's got a, an older telescope that has a Fecker lens in it. And then I just found these pictures. I thought you might be interested. This is a meetings of the uh, American Astronomical Society, I think in the 20s, and I noticed that there was Mr. Fecker in there. And then I saw another year later in the 20s, and there was Mr. Fecker again. And then I saw another one. And I looked a little closer, and I saw that this fella was at it. And this guy is, um, we can probably give most of the credit for, for bringing the Fecker Telescope to Athens, Ohio, and Ohio University, and that's Victor Godeke, Dr. Victor Godeke. He taught mathematics 
and astronomy here at Ohio University. This was an early observatory in Athens up on uh, Roosevelt Street. Thought y'all wanted to know about that. I don't know what kind of telescope was in it. We're still looking into that. Maybe somebody knows, but I don't. And anyway, here's the uh, Fekker telescope that uh, Victor Godecky negotiated with the Fekker company for in 1950. And there it is on the roof of the engineering building back early on. And you can see the science hall there in Bentley Hall. And then there's Dr. Victor Godecky with somebody unknown to me. And then uh, here's Dr. Godecky commenting about how good the Fekker telescopes are. And here's the Fekker telescope many years later. Uh, this was a night in 1994 when George and I were uh, showing uh, people the comet that hit Jupiter. And I, I can also say that when Halley's Comet came, about a thousand people got to come up and see Halley's Comet and get disappointed. Uh, that's sad because it's not the telescope's fault, though. It was Halley's fault. Not even Halley. The com we'll blame it on the comet. It's far enough away. Anyway, that was it. And then, you know, it, it just didn't get the right home at the outset. It was in a plywood shed, and nothing ever happened to this thing. It never got hit or bounced or hit by a plane or anything. It just, the weather got to it, and it kind of slowed down, got harder to move all the time. And so that was it just before it got disassembled. There it is today. And I have to give, you know, Doug and Mike so much credit for this. You know, I, I showed you pictures of Clark and, and Brashier and Fecker and the Lohman brothers. And next time I give this slideshow, I need to get pictures of Doug and Mike in there, too because they played a key role in astronomical development in the state of Ohio. Thank you, guys.